Well, let's, let's pray. Father, we just come to you this morning and um, pray you'd bless our time uh, in the Word as we continue to look at Paul's exhortation to a church that had a lot of problems. Uh, the church in, uh, in the world, in America today, has a lot of problems uh, as well. Uh, we just pray that um, this issue of rewards, rewards in heaven, something we don't talk a lot about uh, in our culture <clears throat> as Christians, but they do a lot around the world uh, where there's persecution, where they're suffering. They're, they're re- really living for heaven and the rewards that they will receive there. Lord, I pray that it would become uh, important to us as well, uh, a motivating factor as it is intended to be. And we ask this uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's, uh, again, in the, in the bigger context, and I want to set that because I want to read a little quote to you that also is uh, uh, pertinent to this weekend, uh, is that the bigger context is uh, Paul is trying to get the, the church in Corinth to, to see the distinction between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. Uh, and, uh, and we talked about the fact that um, uh, in our culture, there's, uh, uh, even in the church, there's been a tendency to uh, judge the Bible by the philosophies of the world rather than judge the philosophies of the world uh, by the Bible. And when, we're gonna, when we do that, when we take a stand for biblical truth and we say there is absolute truth that we can derive from Scripture, uh, we are going to be called fools for Christ, Paul says. And uh, I just wanted to read this quote to you. Uh, by a very uh, distinguished gentleman that would agree with us. Uh, He writes, God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools, and he has not been disappointed. If I brought any message today, it is this, have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity, be fools for Christ, and have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. So says Supreme Court Justice Anton Scalia who just uh, went to be with the Lord uh, a couple days ago and will be uh, greatly missed in this country and something to uh, pray for. Very, uh, uh, very conservative, held to the Constitution, held to godly uh, values and principles, and, um, and he will be uh, greatly missed uh, on the Supreme Court. And, of course, there'll be a, a battle now with our current president. Whatever, whatever you think about him, there's two things that are obvious. He does not like Christians. If you haven't uh, come to that conclusion, uh, and he doesn't really like to hold to the Constitution, so uh, we would, um, we're hoping, we should be praying that the Senate would be able to hold off any kind of confirmation at least until the next election, and then we we pray somebody with some similar values to ours can can be elected. That's there's no guarantee uh, on either side of the aisle on that one, but uh, that's what certainly we're we're praying for. Uh, but that's the bigger bigger issue here is the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of man. Uh, And in uh, talking about this issue of carnality, are are we going to, as Christians, live like people in the world or really live for the Lord? That was our subject last week. Uh, 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 Paul now gets into this issue of uh, of rewards. I uh, I read a story this week of um, uh, a minister that uh, died, and he was standing at the pearly gates waiting, waiting to get in, and he noticed a fellow in front of him and uh, this is one of those St. Peter at the Gate stories. And um, I don't know why Peter, he's the uh, chief apostle, but he ends up the gatekeeper in heaven in these jokes. Uh, but uh, anyway, maybe it's because uh, non-Christians like these jokes, and that's the only person they know that might be in heaven. But uh, uh, anyway, St. Peter's at the pearly gates, and, uh, and this uh, pastor noticed a guy in front of him, sunglasses and leather jacket on and so forth. And uh, they talk a little bit, and uh, realizes that he's a cab driver from New York and so forth, and then it gets to be their turn in line. And so St. Peter says to, to this guy, who are you that I may know whether to admit you into the kingdom of God or not? And he says, well, I'm Joe Cohen, and I'm from New York. And, and um, that's what it says. And uh, he says, uh, St. Peter says to him, take this silk robe and this golden staff and enter the kingdom, my friend. So then the minister gets up uh, next, and he says the same thing to him. Tell me who you are that I may know whether to uh, allow you to enter the kingdom of heaven or not. And he says, well, I'm Joseph Snow, pastor of St. Mary's Church for the last 43 years. Uh, and St. Peter says, well, 
take this cotton robe and this wooden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says, wait, just wait a minute. That, that guy's a taxi cab driver and he gets a silk robe and a golden staff. How can that be? He says, well, up here we judge by results. While you preached, people slept, and while he drove, people prayed. <laughs> well, unlike the joke, uh, heaven is not judged on results. Uh, it's judged on something very differently. That's the way we think about it in terms of, of, uh, of the world. Uh, but we'll see that rewards in heaven are going to be predicated on something other than results that we can see uh, down here on earth. Now again, this uh, uh, comes uh, por- a portion of 1 Corinthians come and dealing with divisions uh, in the church. Uh, the uh, immediate background is the idea that uh, when the Lord comes, what will your position be? Uh, and Paul is a guy that uh, talked about, uh, and as he writes, live for uh, rewards in heaven. Again, we uh, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people probably say, I'll just be glad to get there. I'm not really, that's not one of my big chief concerns. Uh, but I can tell you culturally, it's different around the world. Uh, I've been with, uh, in places like India where it's, um, it's talked about on a regular basis. Uh, when when uh, uh, friends of ours there have talked about their arranged marriages, and one of the things they talked about with their future spouse and the determination of whether they would be married or not would be the idea that if this guy is in the ministry, our friend there, uh, Lalajan, uh, he says to his uh, bride-to-be, I will be in the ministry, and it will be very difficult, and I will walk, work long hours, I will be gone a lot, uh, we may be persecuted, I may be beaten, I may be in prison, it will be a difficult life, but... Whatever I accomplish for the kingdom of God as my wife, you will share equally in heaven. We will receive the same reward. I'm confident of that. And based on that, then he can ask her to marry him. Uh, They think about rewards. They're not really living uh, for this life. Uh, We don't talk about it a lot, again, in the Western culture. Paul writes to the church in Philippi in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not count myself to uh, to have apprehended But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was very concerned about it. I think he was concerned about it for two reasons, the same two reasons we should be concerned as well. First, he just wanted to please the Lord. Uh, And that's what he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, we have as our ambition where they're at home or absent, to be pleasing to the Lord. Uh, and uh, in Acts, he says, uh, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and, uh, and man. Uh, Paul was concerned about a reward because it was the indication that he had lived his life uh, at pleasing to the Lord. The second thing that controlled his life was certainly his, his love for God. Everything was, uh, was uh, directed, uh, directed by it. Uh, and so those two motivating factors should be our same as well. Uh, we should want to receive a reward because it's the indication that we've lived a life pleasing God. We should want to do that uh, because we have a love for God because of what he's done for us. Now, in the context uh, of this passage, and just to say right, right out front, uh, it's about judgment. Uh, all believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, and we need to just say out front, it has nothing to do with sin. Your sin and my sin has been judged in Jesus Christ. Paul says, uh, God made him who had no sin become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, Jesus took all of our sins upon him. Paul says in Romans, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah, Romans 8, 1, therefore is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And when we went through that study, uh, in that beautiful passage uh, in Romans 8, we talked about the fact that uh, it's equivalent uh, in English to a double negative. There therefore is now, no, not ever, no, there never can be ever any condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That would be a literal uh, rendering from, uh, from the Greek text. Uh, so in judgment, we're talking about what we do and how we build, how we live our lives for the Lord. Now, the analogy Paul's been using about ministry and serving the Lord 
because that's how we receive a reward in terms of serving the Lord, has been one of gardening or agriculture. And he talked about, as we saw last week, he says, I planted, but Apollos watered, you remember. Uh, And he equates both these things equally. In other words, whatever it is that God calls us to do for the Lord, uh, if we do that faithfully to the Lord with the right attitude, we'll receive a reward. Uh, it's not based on results. It's not the numbers of people that, um, uh, or the opportunity we have. You may never have a best-selling book or be on the uh, radio nationwide. <clears throat> that has nothing to do with reward. Uh, some plant and others water. Uh, it's uh, God honors all work done to Him uh, as equal uh, and as equally uh, as uh, important. The important thing is, is that you do the work that God's given you to do, and that may be different for every one of us. For some of us, that may be fixing old bicycles and giving them to the kids in the neighborhood so we can show, share the gospel with them. Uh, it's, it's very different from everybody. I uh, <coughs> don't want to uh, uh, belabor this, but a story comes to mind, that uh, wonderful story that... Um, of uh, Reverend Goto, who started uh, three churches on the windward side of Oahu uh, with a baseball bat and a baseball. Uh, and it was a time prior to World War II when, uh, when uh, there were uh, no really very few Christian churches on, um, uh, on the windward side. And he went to a little field that uh, now has become Benjamin Parker uh, Elementary School. And uh, in that field, uh, he got kids together from the neighborhood and uh, said, I can teach you how to play baseball. They were very interested in that. They had no gloves. They had nothing. They'd only heard about the game slightly, taught them how to play baseball, divided them up into teams, and then basically would have like Sunday school stories or Bible stories with them uh, every day that they practiced uh, eventually, that allowed them uh, entrance into their parents' home, where he led uh, several of them to faith in Christ, uh, and that became the nucleus uh, of the Methodist church that is still there uh, in Kaneohe. Then he got on his bicycle, and he rode to Kailua, and he did the same thing. Uh, and then he rode his bicycle to Kahalu and did the same thing. Uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot to have an impact for the kingdom of God. Uh, the important thing is that we do the work that God has called us to do. Uh, and um, for the spirit-filled believer that does that with the right attitude, there is a future reward. For the carnal believer that we looked at last time, there will be no reward in heaven. That's, that's, that's Paul's uh, uh, exhortation here. Uh, again, we're only going to go through uh, verses 10 to 15. I had to omit the last couple. They were uh, maybe in the top of your notes, but uh, we're going to save those for next time. Uh, So we're saying in verses 10 to 11, our lives spiritually are compared to a building, and very simply from 12 to 15, (coughs) what we build for the Lord must be able to survive. Let's take a look at uh, verses 10 to 11. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. Uh, But let, let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul's the, the master builder of this spiritual house, he says. And he says, note first uh, in verse 1, that it was uh, built by the grace of God, according to the grace of God, which was given to me. And that's Paul's exhortation all along in his epistles. Uh, all that he's done has simply been by God's grace, uh, his unmerited, undeserved favor that he gave to the Apostle Paul. In fact, uh, and says to, to Timothy on an occasion that based on what my life was like before as a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church, for God to save me, I think I've kind of become the trophy of grace. If you can't see grace in my life, uh, then you, you don't understand the concept. He says uh, in writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.12, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. So Paul becomes the example of grace. Uh, The reason that you and I can, in this analogy, build a spiritual house, the foundation we'll see is in Jesus Christ, but we can can work and we can build something for the Lord is because of the grace of God. 
Uh, but notice again, the spiritual house has uh, a master builder. And uh, that uh, word in the Greek is uh, architecton. You can, you can assume what uh, uh, English word we, uh, we get from that Greek word, architect. Uh, but in this case, in the Greek word, it meant the architect as well as the general contractor. It was a person who designed and, uh, and built. Uh, and that's what uh, Paul uh, spent his life doing. We'd say he was an expert in foundations. <laughs> he traveled uh, the Roman world laying the foundation uh, for a, a lot of spiritual buildings, literally churches that were built. But of course, we're not talking buildings, we're talking uh, people's lives. Uh, again, he said he was... Um, uh, to the church in Ephesus, he was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. Uh, and he considered himself to be the least of, of all the saints, a builder by the grace of God. That's something we can all be. Uh, then notice there's a warning. There's a warning in regards to building a spiritual building. Uh, again, our lives are building the lives of others in the second half of verse 10. But let each one take heed to how he builds on it. So Paul's the example. He's been talking about himself. He's no longer talking about himself alone. He says, and now, and now you, now each one. Each one uh, is involved in the same thing, the same process. Whatever gifts and talents and abilities and opportunities, it's all different for all of us. But uh, again, in the context of the Corinthian church, the problem was their carnality, their, their selfishness uh, that they had. And we talked about that uh, uh, you can be a believer and be a carnal believer. Uh, uh, you can be a, be a believer, apparently, saved by the grace of God and still live this selfish existence, even though God's given you a new nature. Uh, there's a war that goes on within us, uh, and these guys were losing, losing the war. And, um, and it's interesting how, uh, you know, so many people can start out, and we talked about that. It was like they started out well, but something had happened to them. Uh, and I was just reading again. Uh, in another online article this week about uh, GFA or Gospel for Asia, uh, such a, a sad story, and uh, you know we were directly involved uh, with them for a number of years. And uh, Strat uh, was our associate pastor that uh, uh, left. We sent to be on staff with them for ten years. I've traveled to India, taught in their schools, and so forth. At one time, uh, the largest missions organization in the world, uh, impacting thousands and thousands uh, of people. Uh, and, uh, and now they're, uh, they're imploding, you know, that, and what the article I was reading about was the most current class action lawsuit against them, their criminal uh, uh, charges uh, uh, waiting to, uh, uh, to be filed against them, uh, simply because they, they began something very good, a tremendous building for God, but they, they ended up becoming carnal uh, in, in the way that they were doing. Uh, God is concerned not just what we do, but why we do it. Also, how we do it. Uh, it's a, there's an ethical standard we have to uh, uphold uh, as well. Uh, integrity matters to God. Uh, Paul says, but let each one take heed, take a warning how you're doing it. It's not just what you're doing, but it's how you're doing it uh, as, as well. And of course, their problems were, uh, were financial and in the way that they were allocating monies and so forth. Uh, but a very sad story. Paul says, uh, be warned when you're building a spiritual house. Do you want a reward in the future? You should if you love God and you want to be pleasing to him. Uh, but you need to be careful how you're building integrity matters to God. Thirdly, the foundation for the spiritual building is Jesus Christ. Paul comes to Corinth. He uh, again has said uh, in chapter 2, he came and preached Christ crucified. Uh, lays the foundation, and of course, the foundation to any building, uh, any house is uh, is critical. Uh, the the building, uh, ha, as it goes up uh, in height, uh, it can only go up so high based on the uh, uh, on the foundation. It can only be built so big based on on the um, on the foundation. I know when uh, <laughs> we built a house about twenty years ago, and it was going to have a, it's it's two stories and. I could not believe how much concrete it took and how deep the, the foundation had to be for this, uh, this house, simply because we were going to go up that, uh, uh, that second story. Uh, the foundation is critical. Paul says, no other foundation can anyone lay other than that which is laid, which is uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, again, so the let each one be careful. The foundation needs to be Jesus Christ. Uh, the let each one is... Um, as a present active indicative, it just means it's continual. We continually need to be careful. What's the foundation of what we're doing? 
What are we really building on or building our lives on, uh, the things that we're doing for the Lord? It needs to be on Jesus Christ and in, in who he is. And of course, uh, in its, uh, we're, one thing that's not, when it says Jesus Christ, there's actually a, uh, it's Jesus the Christ. He's the, he is the Messiah. Uh, that is the uh, foundation for everything we do. Uh, of course, it was a concern of Jesus as he asked his disciples there in Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? He was concerned that they had the right foundation. In Matthew 16, 13, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Uh, the, the son of, uh, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that uh, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail uh, against us. What are people saying uh, about me? Because the foundation has to be that Jesus is the Messiah. He says to Peter, you are Petros, a uh, little, little stone. But upon this Petra, this large rock uh, there at the base of Mount Hermon, uh, I will build my church. Uh, did God build his church on, on Peter? No, he built it on the confession of Peter. Uh, you are the Messiah of Israel. You are the Christ, uh, the son of the living God. And everything we do should be predicated uh, upon that. Uh, I, think, I think we kind of get that in terms of uh, if somebody's called to evangelism, he's not going to get very far if he's not letting people know who Jesus is uh, and so forth. But you know there are missionaries that serve for decades in the mission field, uh, and they might be doctors or nurses or educators, uh, engineers or whatever, and some of them never ever tell anybody about Jesus Christ and who he is. To them, they think it's just enough that they're out serving others. It's not just enough that you're out serving others. You've actually got to tell them uh, the, uh, the message. Uh, we have a, a good friend that was uh, part of the uh, Hatanaka's church here at, uh, with Pastor Santo and we knew her for many years. She was a, a chef in a very nice, uh, nice restaurant, and uh, she decided to, uh, to do something to try to reach people in her apartment building. Uh, she noticed there's a lot of seniors that live there that probably never had the opportunity to go out to a nice restaurant uh, anywhere. So she determined she would go around door to door and invite them to dinner once a month, and she would prepare a very nice meal for them. Uh, and she did that once a month, uh, month after month, for almost a year. Uh, and then when she, as she did this, uh, praying for the right moment, then she set them down and said, I want to explain to you and tell you why I've been doing this. You may be think that I'm doing this because I want you to know that I'm a very good chef, but that's not the reason. Uh, you may uh, think that I'm doing this so that you'll know that I'm a very good, kind person. That's actually not the reason either. The reason I'm doing this is so I can tell you now about Jesus Christ and his love for you, and she shared the, the gospel with them. Uh, that's what's supposed to happen. Uh, the foundation, if we're building a house spiritually uh, of our lives, what we do for the Lord, whatever it is, the foundation of it has to be that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Christ, that he's the Savior of the world. That's what Paul says here, and, and he says, let each one uh, be, uh, uh, be warned about this, uh, that we don't leave out the message of the gospel. Our lives spiritually are compared to a building, Paul says, and every builder has to be careful, and every builder will be held responsible. Uh, as long as you're alive, as long as I'm alive on this earth, we're all building something spiritually. Uh, it's either going to be uh, spirit-led uh, and receive a reward, or it could be carnal. We're doing it for the uh, wrong reasons. Uh, every time we're in fellowship with other believers, uh, whatever we're doing with our lives spiritually, uh, it, it all counts uh, in terms of the Lord. Uh, and of course, we had a wonderful teaching last night for the uh, marriage fellowship that the, even in the marriage relationship, we'll receive a reward depending upon how we've lived uh, that relationship uh, with one another. What are we building? Well, secondly, what we build for the Lord must be able to survive. That's in verses 12 to 15. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, 
Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, it, uh, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer a loss, but he himself will be saved, uh, yet so as through fire. So the key word there is in verse 14, if anyone's work uh, on which he is built uh, on it endures, is it able to endure? The NIV uses the term survive. Uh, will what we do in this spiritual house, again, the analogy of our work for the Lord, what we do for the Lord, is it going to be able to survive uh, in the future? Verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation, of course the foundation is Christ, that he is the Messiah, uh, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. So uh, two opposite kinds of materials, uh, gold and silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, some are permanent, some are passing and very temporary. Some are beautiful, some are very ordinary. Some are valuable, some are very cheap or inexpensive. Some are hard to obtain, some are easy to obtain. The carnal believer in the church in Corinth here uh, is building with wood, hay, and stubble, Paul seems to indicate. Uh, a spirit-filled believer uh, should be building uh, with gold, silver, and precious stones. Again, the materials do not represent, they do not represent your wealth, your talents, or your opportunities. Uh, they do not represent your spiritual gifts. Uh, we all receive different gifts, or uh, gifts singular or plural, uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, according to the grace of God as He sees fit. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're really just talking about our works and what we do for the Lord. Verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation. So notice it's the, the anyone. We're not just talking about Paul as an apostle or an evangelist. It's not just directed to church leaders. Uh, it's anyone. So again, the carnal believer will always uh, have a view towards accomplishments uh, for, for results. But when we build for the Lord using various materials, uh, it will expose our motives, our conduct, and our service. Our motives, our conduct, uh, and our service. What motivates us to do what we want to do? Uh, if a person sings a, a solo in church, are they singing so that everyone will know what a beautiful voice they have? Or are they singing for the glory of God? Do you understand the difference? One is, one is hay and, and one is gold. It's, uh, uh, it's that simple. Somebody may uh, be very generous uh, in giving to the kingdom of God. Uh, and may, it could be gold if they're giving for just the joy of the Lord and to see how God might uh, use the, the resources that he's entrusted. Uh, if, they're, if they're doing it, uh, so that they get their, their, their plaque, uh, their name on a plaque on the wall. Uh, and I've, uh, from my uh, career building stained glass windows, I can tell you most of, the, most of the windows I built for most of the churches that I did, somebody's name went on a plaque below it saying that they had, uh, uh, they had uh, given the money for the window. Uh, and they always used to tell me, you know, we have no problem raising the money for the window. It's the floor that's a problem. Nobody wants their name on the plaque on the floor. They always want it up on, on, uh, on the window. But uh, that's, that's wood, hay, and stubble uh, versus, uh, versus gold. Again, uh, what motivates us and then our conduct, as I said, integrity matters to the Lord. It's just not what we're doing. It's actually how we do it. And then our service uh, as we're doing it. Uh, what, what are we like uh, in doing it if we're serving others? Are we kind or not? Are we really the uh, ambassadors for Christ that, that, uh, that God calls us to be? As Paul would say, as we get to chapter 11, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Secondly, what we build for the Lord must be able to survive. And notice on the day, anytime you see the day and it's capitalized, you know it has to do with judgment. Each one's work must become clear for the day. We'll declare it a judgment day. Because it will be revealed by fire, to follow the analogy here, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort uh, it is. So there's a future judgment day for all believers. Again, everybody has eternal life. Uh, you can receive Christ, uh, be forgiven your sins, and have eternal life in heaven. You can reject Jesus Christ, you still have eternal life. Uh, your destination is, uh, uh, is in a place you don't want to go to. Everybody has eternal life. Uh, and uh, for the non-believer, of course, they're, they're judged, what we call the white throne judgment. 
uh, their sins and their life will be judged uh, because the blood of Christ has not been shed for them in the sense that it has not covered their sins. Their sins have not been taken away. But every believer will be judged uh, at the beam of seat of Christ. And again, we've even showed you pictures early on uh, of Corinth and the bema seat that is, uh, that is still there. Uh, something in the Roman world, something we associate uh, today with, with the Olympic Games. Uh, at the end of the uh, Olympic contest, uh, the person who finishes first, second, or third will stand on the bema seat and receive a, a reward. And, uh, and that's the idea here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a judgment for rewards. Uh, so the question is, again, uh, why we do what we do? Uh, later in chapter 4, he'll mention this idea of judging once again. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. There's going to be a judgment time in the, in the future until the Lord comes. Uh, when is the judgment going to come? It's when the Lord comes, who will bring both to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. Each one's praise will come from God. One day, you and I will stand before the beam of seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll receive praise from, from God. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, uh, this in a moment, but it's the idea of a crown. A crown is, uh, is given for various reasons. Uh, the Bible talks about it. Uh, and again, if we love the Lord and uh, we have a, and again, I, I think there's this tendency sometimes to think, well, I'll just be, I'll just be glad, you know, that I get to heaven. If I don't have a reward, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I don't think you're going to be good with that. Uh, and that's, that's really at the heart of the message here. I think it's what Paul is to say. I don't think you're going to be good with that uh, when, when that time uh, arrives. Uh, over in, uh, in writing to the same church in, Ch- in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, he says, for We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Uh, 1 Peter 1.6, Peter writes about the same issue. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, when, when is the Bema seed occurred? At the revelation or the coming of Jesus Christ. Again, uh, the rapture can occur at any moment. Uh, and, uh, and if it does, we're going to be with the Lord. Uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. We will meet them together in the air. Uh, we'll be with the Lord uh, for a period of time until the tribulation begins. Will it begin immediately after the rapture? We have no idea. Uh, But once it begins, there's a seven-year period of the tribulation that's going on. We're with the Lord in heaven, and then the Lord will come, uh, and He will judge this world and set up His kingdom, and then there'll be the Bema Seat of Christ. I just find that interesting that there there is a, a gap in time when we're with the Lord before this judgment occurs. I think we'll have some time to think about and wonder about what will that be like? I would suggest you think about it now and not then. Uh, that's, that's the whole point here. Uh, those that survive uh, will be rewarded. Verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on, uh, excuse me, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive uh, a reward. Now again, uh, I think there's a passage in, uh, in Revelation 21 that's kind of always fascinated me, and it's a very simple one. You're familiar with it. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, there's a previous passage, uh, and he's talking about the tribulation saints, and they're at the throne of God, and they're, and they're saying, how long, O Lord, uh, in terms of you, until you bring judgment on this Christ-rejecting world, uh, because they've been through the tribulation, they've been martyred for their faith, they have a special place of God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is different. Uh, this is a different group of people. Uh, so why, why are there tears in heaven that need to be wiped away? We might ask that question. Uh, but uh, it could have something to do. It's at least worth considering this idea of rewards in, in heaven. Uh, maybe it really does matter. Maybe it will matter to us a, a lot more at, at that time. So what will the rewards uh, be? Well, the Bible refers to them as, uh, as crowns. 
Uh, and we have a picture of uh, a group of men that represent uh, the church age believers uh, in heaven. And this is in Revelation 4.4. 4. Uh, and you're going to see that they have uh, gold crowns on their heads. I'll just I'll talk, I'll read it and I'll just talk to you briefly uh, about them. Uh, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold uh, on their heads. Now, when we did our study of Revelations and we got to this chapter, I went through a litany of reasons to indicate why this is the, uh, a group of people that are representing the church age, age believers. It has to do with the number 24. There were 24 courses of priests in the Old Testament. We could give some other examples. That means it was the whole group. Uh, there's 24 elders, the whole group. They're in heaven. This is all prior to the tribulation. My point is, you've got a group of people representing, that's us, church age believers in heaven, and they have gold crowns uh, on their head. They're wearing white, white robes, uh, and they are being described as those that overcome. How do we overcome? It's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, the word here is Stephanos for crown. When we see Jesus in Revelation 19, he's wearing a crown. It's the word diadem. That's what a crown wears. Stephanos is a, well, it's a hakule, <laughs> basically. Uh, in that day, uh, in that terminology, uh, and they're equivalent to the Olympic Games, prior to the Olympics, uh, they, uh, athletes were awarded, and it would be what we know as a, as a hakule. Probably not as nice as ours, but uh, that's, what it, that's what it was. Uh, so that's the idea. Uh, it's a prize. Uh, it's, it's that, but it's made out of gold. Uh, Jesus' crown is different. He wears the crown of a, uh, of a king. Uh, but again, the crowns are the rewards. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to go through a, a, a little thing about the crowns as rewards uh, that I've, and just to um, tell you where it came from, it came right from uh, David Hawking. That's why it's all beautifully alliterated for us. But uh, I just thought this was very good about the crowns. We're talking about rewards. They're pictured in heaven as <laughs> as crowns. And um, I, um, I, I did, it was just, uh, again, no coincidence that in our, our marriage study last night, it was about rewards, <laughs> that we're going to uh, receive a reward in heaven. Guys, uh, if you really love your wife unconditionally, the gals will receive a reward in heaven if they, lo if they respected their husbands un unconditionally. That was the, uh, the lesson uh, last, last night. And uh, Dr. Uh, Egerich introduced it with the idea of, uh, of saying uh, it, what he calls, it'll be one of those first moments, a first moment. The ah, you know, he says, he says if you can think about maybe that, that, that bicycle that you always wanted when you're 10 years old and you, you finally got up at, at 5 in the morning, you, you uh, realized it was in fact Christmas Day and you ran, you ran down uh, to, the, to the living room and there in front of the tree was the, the very bike you, you always wanted and you, as you saw it, what you sensed right then. He says there's going to be a lot of that going on in heaven. Uh, whatever it is. <laughs> he wanted to give another analogy. He was doing an analogy. He was doing a... a a seminar for a bunch of guys on Wall Street, and, when, and he says, how many of you have had one of those moments? And some guy reads and said, yeah, I just got a $100,000 bonus the other day, and I kind of had that moment. And uh, he said, if somebody said that to me, I'd have a heart attack, not a moment. But uh, uh, whatever you think is like the best thing that you ever, you know, heaven, there'll be a lot of that in heaven. But it's, it's symbolized here in terms of crowns. Uh, and uh, uh, six things about the crowns uh, from uh, David Hawking. Uh, the crowns are invaluable as to worth. Notice they're made of gold. It's, it's, it's the most precious metal. It was the metal of, uh, of the highest value. Uh, and compared to anything on this earth, they, are, they will be invaluable. Uh, the crowns are imperishable. Uh, there, there's many things that we can be awarded on this earth, and they perish. The crowns are imperishable. Later in chapter 9, Paul's still writing to the church here in Corinth, do you not know that those who run... In a race, all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. I don't know if you're, uh, you're like me or not, but uh, <clears throat> I grew up in a home. My, 
brother and I played sports, and, and uh, by the time we got out of high school and left for college, uh, we made a few other uh, donations after that to my dad's mantle, but it was pretty much stacked with, uh, with trophies. Uh, and, uh, and I can tell you, I have no idea where they are, I, I, but I know they went to Goodwill or some, somewhere eventually, you know. Uh, that, that's what happens to these things. I, uh, I remember one time uh, our good friend uh, John Cuneo, who's uh, now with the Lord, and he was over at the house, and, and uh, he was upstairs, and he went into our son Josh's room. Josh was an athlete, and like Melissa, was a, a, you know, a very fine scholar, won, won lots of awards, and we couldn't figure out what to do with all these things after a while, but we had cathedral ceilings, so I had built shelving in the perimeter way up high to kind of get these things up and off the floor. And as uh, John happened to walk into Josh's room, he just started doing the, like this, all, <laughs> seeing these trophies. Of course, the, those are the days they give you a trophy for just showing up, but uh, he actually, if you win something, I mean, he, he had a, they won a, a Little League championship, he had a trophy that was that big. You, you'd think he'd won the Super Bowl or something, but... Uh, <laughs> Daytona 500, but uh, amazing. John says, well, I don't think your son's going to have any issues with self-esteem. I said, no, I don't, I don't think so, John. I have no idea where those trophies are. They all went to Goodwill or, or somewhere. Uh, all these achievements, whatever they are, academically, athletically, uh, business, uh, they're, I hate to say it, they're all going in the garbage at some point in time. You just can't keep them for, forever. It's perishable, but the crowns in heaven are imperishable. They, they won't ever go away. Is, is the idea. Eternity is a long time. The crowns in heaven are incomparable, third, to any earthly achievement. 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. It will never fade away. It's incomparable to anything here on, on earth. Uh, four, the crowns in heaven are inseparable from the people they represent. And I like this, and there's more than a couple of verses that talk about this. Philippians 4, 1, Therefore, my beloved, uh, and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Paul compares the people, the people he's come to know. Paul's been involved in the process of building a house, building the kingdom of God, working for the Lord. And the people he's come to know and love along the way, he says, you guys are actually my crown. He goes, I don't know what I got coming in heaven, but... Uh, he saw people as inseparable from the crowns and the rewards themselves. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, he says, For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory uh, and joy. Paul's saying there there's a crown of rejoicing. It has to do with relationships with other people uh, that he's come to know, that he's been able to uh, invest in. And uh, the NIV says, we really live uh, because you're standing firm in the Lord. Uh, so in other words, Paul says, real living is when you have something to do with somebody else being able to stand firm uh, in the Lord. So he associates and makes it inseparable, the crown from the people. Hebrews 6.10 says that, uh, for God is not unjust to forget your work uh, and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name and that you have ministered to the saints uh, and do minister. God's, God's, God's got it all, all, uh, all recorded. He's not forgetting anything. Even a cup of water given in His name. Even a cup of water given in His name, the Lord records and, uh, and knows about. Five, the crowns in heaven are inspirational uh, in our Christian life. Uh, again, writing from the uh, Mamertine prison in Rome, Paul says uh, to Timothy, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, a particular crown, which, uh, in, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved uh, his appearing. Uh, for every believer who is looking forward to the appearing, and of course that means looking for, believing, trusting, living for the appearing of Jesus Christ, uh, there is a crown of righteousness uh, that is awaiting them. Six, the crown in the heavens, crowns in heaven are indestructible as to eternal life. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who, who love him. Again, this is a crown for uh, every believer to reserve, uh, receive, enduring temptation. 
uh, being approved, receiving the crown of life. Uh, Revelation 2.10, uh, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison <clears throat> that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days or for a set period. Uh, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted and, uh, and uh, lives are being uh, destroyed there in northern Iraq and Syria, uh, in Africa today, uh, the ones that are still being held in prison in places like Cuba that we've just uh, uh, opened up relationships uh, with again, uh, uh, they will receive a special crown uh, in, in heaven. Uh, when Jesus returns, in Revelation twenty two twelve, 12, <clears throat> he says this, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work, according to what he's doing in building this spiritual house. So believers survive uh, even after, even after the building is burned up. So the uh, the the uh, encouragement is for to uh, to live for the Lord, to build for the Lord, uh, to do it with the right motive, the right service, the right uh, integrity. Uh, but of course, uh, the believers here in Corinth uh, were very carnal. That was uh, that was the problem, rooted in pride. Uh, notice verse fifteen: If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. You know, he is, is escaping through the, through the fire. So uh, they stand before the beam of scene of Christ, and the, uh, the images, they, uh, they, they make it out, but their clothes smell like smoke, uh, you know, when, as they uh, enter, uh, enter heaven. Uh, again, nobody's salvation is being discussed here. Uh, heaven is a free gift uh, from God to us through Jesus Christ. Uh, but there is a judgment uh, that will await uh, every believer. We've said that our lives are spiritually are compared to building a house. Every, every believer is building something. It's either gold, silver, precious stone, or it's wood, hay, and stubble. And I think we probably have some good days, bad days. <laughs> I don't think we get on this track and then we're just okay. I think there's, uh, there's plenty, of, plenty of days that uh, what I do for the Lord could be chalked up to straw, you know, and there's, uh, there's other days I pray that uh, uh, there might be a few precious stones along the way, but uh, I think it's like that for, for all of us. But I think it should be a concern, this idea of rewards in heaven. We had a message a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night of the, uh, of those, of the regrets in hell from Luke 16, but I think for at least for a period of time, there could be some regrets uh, in heaven uh, as well. I don't think we uh, often think about that. Uh, we build for the Lord, and what we build must be able to survive the judgment day. A future reward or a future uh, regret. I've mentioned it before, but there's been uh, more than a few occasions I'm with somebody in the hospital. They know that they're near the end of their life, and they usually have two regrets. One is they wish they had spent more time with their family. It's very common. Where they wish they had spent more time with their family, uh, and they wish they had done more for the Lord. Those are the two commonalities. It doesn't matter the age or how long they've been, been, been a believer. Uh, but we've only got one life. We've got a little, a little uh, sign out there in the hallway that we put up a while back. It's based on uh, a poem written by C.T. Studd, great preacher of a few generations ago. I won't read it in its entirety, but some of the lines go like this. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, uh, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And uh, I would say the only thing that will last in terms of a reward is that which is done as God's leading us by his spirit as we do 
uh, out of uh, not of a selfish motivation, not rooted in pride, but simply because we want to please the Lord and because we love the Lord. Those are the buildings, those are the things that will be rewarded in heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, uh, we, uh, we don't often think of this subject. We read about it in Scripture. Paul seemed to be very, uh, very concerned about it and mentions it several times. Uh, lots written uh, in the New Testament about the crowns that, that will be received in, in heaven and certainly even the reference of standing before your throne and casting our crowns before you. I would think on that day uh, we would uh, hope that we have something to return even though it was something given by your grace. Paul predicated all this to say that everything he's done has been by the grace of God and that grace is available to all of us. Everything that he's done that's been worthwhile has been led, empowered by the Spirit, not the flesh, not the carnal, selfish nature. Lord, may we be led by your Spirit. May we not buy into the wisdom of the world, but rather the wisdom of your Word. May we, as Justice Anton Scalia said, be willing to be a a fool for Christ, but never allow us to allow the philosophies of, of this world to judge us, but rather have us judge the philosophies of this world from your scriptures, Lord. In them are the words of life. In them we have truth. Lord, use it to instruct our hearts and minds that we might build a building for you. In Jesus' name, amen.